Um, so working backwards, what we have running right here, this is OpenStack deployed on top of a Kubernetes cluster. So it's already there. Um, I've got four hosts in this infrastructure. I'll show you how I built it. Um, the default script right now does not populate a whole bunch of images and flavors and things like that. That's a change that we have coming. Um, so I can't, I'm not going to try and spend a lot of time running OpenStack for you. Um, just the fact that I can bring up Horizon and register things is actually a pretty big deal. Um, this is what Kubernetes looks like. One name shot. And um, we've got people remote. So if you're remote, please mute. Um, the, um, and in this, in this infrastructure, um, this is the dashboard for Kubernetes. Kubernetes is really an API set, and people build things on top of it. Dashboards of project within Kubernetes um, that's deployed on Kubernetes. And so that, so this is the OpenStack piece. There's actually a Ceph component. So this is what the Ceph uh, infrastructure would look like with all the pieces. Um, and then that works through uh, something called Helm, which I'll talk about. Um, and how many people, before I dive way deep, how many people have seen anything about Kubernetes at all? How many people have installed OpenStack? Okay, excellent. Um, so this, this dashboard should be pretty familiar if you're used to it. Basically, we're building pods. We're going to talk about how. We're going to go into a whole bunch of details and, and what all that works looks like and how it works. Um, and the deployment, so if I was going to spin up a new deployment, um, for this infrastructure, what I would do is, um, this is the rebar UX, and in that interface, I would build an OpenStack cluster. So we're gonna go through and just create OpenStack 2. We're doing this on um, a bare metal hosting provider called Packet. Uh, there's actually, if you, if you wanna play with this yourself, all of, everything I'm doing tonight's running on Packet. Uh, to run OpenStack on Kubernetes, it's much easier to do it on bare metal than it is to do VMs on VMs. Um, and you can use a code RackN100 will get you, um, I don't know how much it is right now. It used to be $100, but they've been inching it down. Um, but a credit for, for free uh, packet servers. Uh, so we'll do packet as a deployment target. Uh, I can pick some things about Kubernetes, some networking options. Uh, and then it's by default, it's going to offer me to create a huge cluster. I'm not going to do that. And I get to pick where my control plane is. I could separate my control plane from my workers. I could create HA deployments and things like that. All, that's, all this stuff is actually um, perfectly normal for our Kubernetes infrastructure. But what I've done here is I've picked, I've, I've basically said, I want three nodes in my cluster. I'm going to have, one, the first node is going to be my control infrastructure. It's going to be my control infrastructure for Kubernetes and OpenStack. It's going to put those together. And then I'm going to create two nodes that provide my OpenStack uh, control, my OpenStack worker infrastructure. And I can hit next here. And then when I do that, it will build a JSON file. The JSON file is actually the thing that, that Digital Rebar acts on. So the UX just builds this JSON file um, that describes what attributes I want, uh, what I want to call the deployment, what operating system I need, and then um, basically go build multiple groups of nodes out of out of packet when I hit next here what will happen is it's going to go through build a, a new OpenStack deployment figure out all the roles and things that are needed I'll show you what that looks like over here so it's going to build OpenStack 2 this is what the end result would look like uh, in digital rebar which is a lot of different roles and activities uh, for the infrastructure. So it's going to build nodes, get access to them, uh, propagate SSH keys, so I have access. And then it's going to put the appropriate, it's all using this, uh, this cargo Ansible pieces, but it, it'll build the Kubernetes cluster uh, as a set of Ansible plays, execute those, and then when that completes, it'll install Helm. Uh, I'll describe Helm. Helm is basically a, a Templating language for Kubernetes. It's like heat for Kubernetes at a very high level It will install helm and then after helm is installed it'll drive Helm charts which are the the description of OpenStack for Kubernetes in this model So a lot a long chain of logic. It's all going to get executed in sequence to make all this stuff work. Big part of what our objectives are 
is to try and make uh, all this open source technology work together as an integrated set. So bring community best practices into action and make it so that they can be consumed and then even more importantly shared. One of the things that happened in OpenStack that we found very frustrating is that operators would take their work, they'd fork whatever they had and they'd go run it, and it was very hard for them to then share operational learning back into the community because they would be basically be unique. That uniqueness made it so that everybody was doing OpenStack a little bit differently and made it really hard to work together. Also made it really hard for the distros that sprang up to share. The Mirantis way to do it was different than the Red Hat, different than the Cisco, different than the IBM. Everybody had different ways to do things and they couldn't collaborate. We really felt in trying to approach the Kubernetes community and now this OpenStack Helm stuff, that if we could find a way that you would just use community Ansible or community Helm charts or something like that, you could save the community, the operator operations community a lot of angst because they could take things in, they could fix things and they could share back. So that full cycle was a big, a big part of what we were doing. Um, all right, so now behind the scenes, we're basically gonna go through and it's gonna run and build uh, this, this deployment um, and it'll execute all this stuff. It's all, all this is running on packet. So both my server is packet. I'm not running anything except the UI from my desktop. And then both deployments are set completely separate, isolated deployments running on packet. And it'll go through. It takes a little bit of time. There's packet. Assuming I can actually click. There it goes. Okay. Uh, because I'm using SSH to access, eh, I'll explain this. Um, I'm going to run a little slow with everything I've got going on in this laptop. But um, so this is the packet infrastructure that's getting built right now um, that we just asked for. So those servers aren't even deployed yet. So it's going to have to wait. Once the servers are deployed, Rebirth is going to automatically know that, going to get access, and it'll start the the process of building. And I'll we, we'll take a break in a minute from the presentation. I'll show you that. Before I jump to slides, I just dumped a ton of technical information. Do I, are there questions before I jump deeper? So, yeah. so can you walk your stack from the bottom up so you're using packet.net? Correct. What are you running directly on top of that? So rebar, or, rebar coordinates and orchestrates the whole stack. So rebar is really on the side. Packet.net and an operating system, in this case CentOS, right? And then those are going to be use uh, Ansible uh, using playbooks that are a group maintained in the OpenStack. Wow, thank you. That's oh, great. Um, so it's going to be a set of infrastructure, reverse on the side, packet at the bottom, CentOS, then Ansible playbooks uh, that are maintained in the community by Cargo. Um, called Cargo, then Kubernetes, which and we're just pulling Kubernetes down out of the Kubernetes repos. And then on top of that, Helm, which is the Kubernetes uh, templating system. And then from Helm, we're using uh, OpenStack, or are going to be OpenStack Big Tent Helm charts. Uh, and those then direct Kubernetes to install OpenStack inside of Kubernetes. And it's actually even a little bit more complex because there's Helm charts for Ceph, and so we build Ceph. Ceph then turns on something called stateful sets in Kubernetes, which allow you to have persistent storage, and because you need that for the database, and then the Helm charts use the persistent storage when they build the database on top. It's a big stack. And it, it's reflected in, uh, in this in this graph, if you see it, it'll, it actually goes all the way through all the stacks. And you can go look at the Helm charts that we apply in the order. It's all, everything I'm showing you is open. You can go to Digital Rebar and see the Kubernetes. It's under Kubernetes workloads and all that. Uh, sorry. Digital Rebar workloads has Helm, um, staff, open staff, or OSP. So uh, under digital rebar workloads, you would have there's Kubernetes, open 
Open Stack, Helm. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff. This this isn't the only thing that we deploy. Nice, it's a nice example. Other questions? Does that seem like a lot to everybody? If it does, then you, that's actually yes. Uh, we'll talk about wow, that's a lot of stuff because that's the subject of the talk. How are you comparing these metrics with random? That's a great question. So the question is um, of the various OpenStack uh, Kubernetes under OpenStack, that's actually the topic, of the, that's the talk. Um, this does not. So this does use Stack and its containers. Um, it doesn't use the Cola containers. Um, but it doesn't use either one of those approaches. Uh, Cola ended up being a, a, a lot of Ansible code. And so it, it really was an Ansible project that used containers. Um, although they, they, they sort of decided they were going to use Kubernetes and then went to Helm charts. Um, but that was sort of after this stuff got started. And then Stackinetis was its own way of doing things because it was sort of very early, not, not a Helm-based thing. Helm, Helm is, is a community project, um, maintained in the community that's really handy for, for basically showing up with a, I need to deploy who. Um, it's still pretty low level, and you would, you know, it's not a pass at that point. It gets a little bit further. Good question. I'm, gonna dive, I'm about to dive into the slides because it, uh, uh, your questions line up with the slides. Are there other technical ones on the stack or the tech? And I can dive as deep in, the, in this stuff as you want to do other demos. That's exactly. I love, I love live demos. It's crazy, crazy fun. Um, slides. That's not slides. That's a good demo. That's a good demo too. All right, so this, this presentation is one that I have given at the OpenStack Barcelona Summit, and then I gave an update for it um, somewhere, somewhere else. Uh, oh, at um, OpenStack Mountain View, Mountain West, the one in Salt Lake City in the middle. Um, and I have updated this because I was much more jaded when I gave this talk the first time. And um, just full disclosure, I, I felt that this was going to not be a good idea. And I've watched progress uh, go through much more quickly than I expected in being able to integrate uh, you know, OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. So the short answer is, if you think this is a bad idea, like I did, um, I have come, come around to thinking this is actually the right thing. Um, and then partly, I think that this is going to happen, and I think part of it is that it's going to make Kubernetes even more powerful as a platform. Okay. We'll talk about some of the impacts. Uh, my background, I was on the OpenStack board for four years. Uh, I led the interoperability efforts on the OpenStack board, so really worked on something called DevCore, if you're familiar with that. Um, in the Kubernetes community, I co-chaired the cluster ops SIG. So when I showed up at Kubernetes about a year and a half ago, um, I really wanted to not repeat the operational issues that OpenStack has had, so I tried to lead in the ops environment. Um, that's a whole other one in question. We can say to the end where that's going. Um, and then uh, I'm founder, co-founder of Digital Rebar and Crowbar. Crowbar was the first OpenStack installer. She still uses it. Um, Digital Rebar is like three generations past that, but that's where the hybrid infrastructure automation pieces come from, and we're trying to automate. Um, these types of problems. And that's, that's what I already talked about right here. And so when you look at what this talk is targeted for, it really talks about addressing operational needs. So I'm not trying to be an upstream contributor to OpenStack or an upstream contributor to Kubernetes, but it's about operating those infrastructures. Right? I'm a very firm believer that uh, operators of these infrastructures, and when they're successful, do not expect to be submitting patches to the code, except for fixing bugs. And even then, a lot of times they want to submit a bug and get it fixed. So they want to run the infrastructure, they want to talk about running the infrastructure. Um, and I 
think it's very important that if you're going to be a super user on that infrastructure, you shouldn't have to learn the infrastructure to use it. So the idea would be, I can maintain Kubernetes without learning Kubernetes. I can maintain OpenStack without learning OpenStack. Right? You shouldn't have to be a power user of OpenStack to run it. And then, but when you think about things from an operational perspective, that means that the community has a responsibility to help operators be successful. The operators aren't responsible for doing that on their own. So you have to, you can't push the rope from that perspective. You have to help the operators be successful. So that's a lot of what this talk does, and it starts from that position and thinks through the operators at the end of the end of the pipe, not putting the operators in front and saying, fix it yourself. I, I really don't like that as, a, as an approach. Um, and to give you a roadmap of what we're talking about here, when I say underlay, not everybody understands what underlay is. Underlay is the idea of this, this bridge between the physical infrastructure and the application that you want to run. So it's a, plat it's a part of the platform where you're dealing with physical concerns. In networking, the network underlay is the switches in physical, when we're talking about this, it's I need to agree about the NICs and the storage and the drive information and the operating system, the BIOS, the RAID, that's all underlay concerns. And in this case, this is what I would call the Kubernetes sandwich, or the, I guess the OpenStack sandwich, um, more, more correctly. But we are talking about putting Kubernetes under OpenStack. There are a lot of people who talk about doing Kubernetes on OpenStack also. Uh, it makes no sense to me or anybody I've talked to to do both. Um, Right, it, it's that becomes sort of a silly exercise where OpenStack has no material value um, in there. So, uh, since most people in the room know what Kubernetes is, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, except to make a couple of important notes. One is Kubernetes is not really orchestration, it's scheduling. Um, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time dwelling on the difference. But it's going to help make sure containers are running on the infrastructure and they keep running. It's not really designed to handle workflow issues and things like that. And it's designed for applications that are designed for it. A little bit circular. But the idea is we're not expecting you to take an existing application and just move it to Kubernetes um, and not have any port or migration or rewriting or things like that. It's getting a little better because we've introduced uh, the ability, some people really hate this pattern, but what they call a stateful set, used to be called a pet set, um, where you would be able to persist data in a container and then move that container around. Um, and that, a lot of people don't think that's even a good pattern, it sort of breaks a lot of the Kubernetes uh, goals, which are immutable infrastructure, 12 factor. If you don't know what those things are, uh, you can talk about it, but Go, go research it. If you're doing containerized work at, at scale, those are pre key concerns of actually being successful with apps. Um, the point I would make is that OpenStack was not designed with this in mind. So it's, it's the reality of how OpenStack was designed. Uh, this is a graph we put together in Cluster Ops for what Kubernetes is. It can look a little scary. Um, the good news is it's not getting any more complex. And it's really not complex at all. If you, if you strip away a lot of these extra services and layers, Kubernetes is really just two things. It's a server, um, an API server, and then that server is, a, is the center of the star, a whole bunch of things called kubelets that manage containers on a whole bunch of nodes. So it, it is pretty simple. There's a storage system called etcd where the data is persisted. Um, so it really ends up looking very much like a three-tier app. And not a lot of hardware over Kubernetes and the way Kubernetes is structured is, is pretty, it's a very sound infrastructure. But people have a tendency to look at Kubernetes, uh, hear about it, and, and the, the enthusiasm people have for it and think that it's going to generate rainbows for them with free upgrades and automatic HA fault zone tolerance history and all this stuff. And it's not true. Um, there is a lot of benefit that you get from using Kubernetes towards those capabilities, but it's not there. Um, if you go back six months and you look at my previous slide of this, I've, I've actually, uh, you can see my um, statements and I try to be accurate about where I was and what I see. Um, OpenStack operation is still not a solved problem. 
There's a lot of people doing it a lot of different ways, still arguing over the right ways to install OpenStack. Kubernetes has the same problem. Um, we can talk about that at the end. But um, Paul and I have already gone back and forth on this. I know you're waiting. Um, most of, when I look at the community, most of the new deployments I see, even things that were traditionally not container-based, have rolled to container-based. Um, that doesn't mean they're Docker-based, but they're definitely putting OpenStack components into containers for isolation. Um, even Triple O now has been moving towards a, a container-based solution. Um, Mirantis' stuff was going there, Rack, Rackspace's was, I think IBM's is, maybe not many of you guys are the, the outliers. But um, as far as I'm seeing, everybody's now packaging their OpenStack deploys in containers to some extent, which leads people to say, well, if I'm using containers already, if I run Kubernetes on it, I'll get all these great behaviors. Um, and this is where the presentation sort of kicks into high gear. Kubernetes is still new. There are not a lot of people who have done and know how to do production deployments of Kubernetes, let alone upgrades and stabilization and networking and Docker keeps changing, breaking things. And so there's, we're not quite at a place where if you were looking for a enterprise HA OpenStack deployment, that putting it on top of Kubernetes is going to give you a lot more stability, just the fact of the maturity of the platform. And even if you did all that, it doesn't mean that rubbing Kubernetes on it is going to make OpenStack HA more upgradable. Because of those issues are actually OpenStack issues, not Kubernetes issues. You still have to be able to handle how you upgrade a database, how you change, uh, incrementally change versions of agents and clients and how do things interact with each other when there's mismatches of versions and how, but those are not handled by Kubernetes. It's made, easier, it's made easier to change things in Kubernetes, but version tolerance and API mismatching, those are, those are app issues, they're not platform issues. Okay. Um, the good news is this used to have some red in it that we're significantly better than we were even six months ago. Um, and there are real benefits, right? Docker packaging does help people manage Python dependencies. Uh, we do get upgrades uh, from Kubernetes built-in process. So you can go ahead and say, oh, I need to, to change the Nova client on you know, 100 machines and then issue a single command and actually change the Nova client on 100 machines. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, there is job schedulers, so you can do maintenance. There's a whole bunch of infrastructure you get for free. Um, you can get fault tolerance in key components because Docker or Kubernetes will make sure things keep running. So you can say, I need you to keep running two copies of my database server, and it'll do it. Uh, so that's, that's really impressive. Um, and then if people are actually adopting Kubernetes, and the, this is going to be the market question that you're going to be thinking tonight, right? If Kubernetes is going to be a dominant platform in data centers, then showing up with, into a site that already runs Kubernetes, it could be really easy then to install OpenStack. What I'm showing you is accurate, right? Because I just did a standard Kubernetes install. It's the same Kubernetes install as for everything else, and I added OpenStack to it. So that option becomes really interesting from an OpenStack market perspective. I have a slide about that. Uh, because it really is going to come back to community size for Kubernetes. Right. The, the thing that I see is Kubernetes will be a bigger community than OpenStack. Right. It runs in the cloud. So you don't have to buy a server, you don't have to look, you know, use a server, boot a server, install an operating system, you don't have to deal with networking. You can go run a command line and install Kubernetes on Amazon. It'll take you about five minutes to do it. So if, when it's that easy to use, the community for Kubernetes is going to grow much faster than it will for OpenStack. The OpenStack is an infrastructure automation platform that requires you to have, ultimately, physical infrastructure to run. There, there are, there should be people who are like, oh, I'm an OpenStack hoster, yay, Rackspace, right, who have been pioneers for that, and that makes OpenStack accessible for you as a cloud infrastructure, and that's an important thing. But for people who are just using OpenStack in their own data centers, it's a much higher bar to get to than Kubernetes. Okay. And from my perspective, that tips the scales on usability. We will find we will, we will soon find a lot more people who use Kubernetes than use OpenStack. If it's not already the case, because cloud is just that much bigger. 
So, hiding her face. Um, so, if Kubernetes is an underlay is coming, then we should get pragmatic and actually say, what is it going to take? How's it going to look? Um, and I want to stop for a second because up until I saw what uh, SAP, at and kind of uh, people, and there's a Port Direct's a small consulting shop. These, this is about five or six people who are the core of this, and there's, we've, we've been picking up steam. Uh, Rack, Rack and participates also, um, uh, and actually some people from Deus um, have, have also been uh, instrumental in making all this stuff. Good. So this is a community effort. I, 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 like anything in community, you're standing on shoulders of giants when you show this. Um, so it's important to know just how much it goes into this. So if this is going to happen, the first problem is, especially when we go back to Austin, OpenStack Austin, Kubernetes under OpenStack is a hot mess, right? Because it tells people Kubernetes is ready to run on, infra on your infrastructure at the bottom, and OpenStack's not. But I don't think we've resolved this. I, I just was reading the notes from the board meeting that they had face-to-face. -face. I think they're getting closer, which I, I appreciate, but it's still a problem. This message, and I'm, I'm repeating the message, I'm as much of, you know, I don't feel have any, any gripes about it. Kubernetes is easier in, to sustain and run on a physical infrastructure system than on this It's hard right. right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be proposing this as much training. Um, I think that OpenStack um, has been pushing a single platform to run metal containers and VMs. So I think that it's confusing if they're going to promote Kubernetes to promote that message. So I think that's that's something they need to address. Um, and I think it just tells people to use Kubernetes. Uh, you know, if you're targeting your app to Kubernetes, you really don't care if it's OpenStack or Metal or Google or Amazon that it covers. Right? That's why you do it. So um, it's a challenge. As an OpenStack community, you have to look at this type of force and acknowledge what's going on and how OpenStack needs to find its place in the ecosystem, not be driving the ecosystem like we used to do five years ago when OpenStack was the sort of king of the cloud, uh, private cloud infrastructure. Um, and this, this goes back to the question we had. There's a ton of ways that you can install OpenStack using containers. Um, Triple O, I didn't even include Stack and Eddies in this. Um, uh, Cola. OpenStack Ansible, there's an Ubuntu cloud install that, that they use their own um, LXC drivers. There's a whole bunch of ways to do it. Um, and right now, it's confusing when everybody's going to raise their hand uh, and say, hey, yeah, we use containers to do our install. That's different than this type of Kubernetes-based install where you're using an underlying. Right. Um, my, my projections of this, uh, hold my projections. Um, so containerization just means I'm using Docker, I'm using containers, they're lightweight, it really solves some packaging problems that we have with Python where we're trying to distribute a whole bunch of code and there's a lot of dependencies. So containers immediately address that. Kubernetes is something additional. It's different than just I added containers as part of into my deployment. It really brings in a container lifecycle. It really brings in um, a degree of mobility of those containers, a lack of control of the IP addresses uh, in those containers, a lack of control of when the containers start and stop. So if you went back two years and you looked at container efforts to install OpenStack, they pinned the containers. They just treated them like VMs or they treated them like a the package. You know, hey, I'm going to start a container that's going to run my service. Kubernetes doesn't do that. Kubernetes, if the server shuts down, it moves a container. If you drain a server, right? Going to move IP addresses around to move identity. But the stack's not really designed for that right now. So it's part of the challenge that we have. And the way we're dealing with it is sort of a, a workaround. Um, so the um, assessment that, though, that I have is that what I'm seeing so far with the approaches that were out of Kubernetes with Helm, that it's so powerful to be able to do it like this that this will start sweeping in the other install mechanisms. So people will start saying, you know what, I just am going to converge to this type of Kubernetes-based approach. 
because it's very straightforward, um, it's very manageable, and you get a lot of benefits from it. Whereas something where like the original cola did a lot of um, what I would call PhD level Ansible to position containers and run containers and dock, right? You, you had to, I do a lot of Ansible and I was like, oh shit, yeah, this is incredible stuff. Um, and I didn't take notes, but then I was, I was scared. Um, and so what what I think you have to be able to do is the Kubernetes stuff actually simplifies. And that's what I that's what I look for. If you look at the original presentation, I was much angrier um, about what I saw going on because I felt like we were just throwing more complexity into the mix. When I looked at what we were doing with this, these home charts, it was simple. And that to me, back to the operational hat, it needs to look simpler. Right? We can't add complexity. Um, and so this is this is a very simple, next slide's better, um, description of what we're talking about, but it's using the Kubernetes uh, 1.5 or above primitives. There were things that came into 1.5, like stateful sets that are required. What about six is a maintenance release. So, um, two story, I'm gonna I'm create a side to this. So the 1.6 release is due out any day now, but uh, the team has stopped the release. They pulled the Kanban cord, um, not Kanban, uh, Kazakh cord, and they will not release uh, 1.6 until the uh, the CI system is running more smoothly and some critical defects are fixed. And I really applaud the Kubernetes community for saying, look, we, we're going to throw away our release schedule until we fix these critical issues. And the 1.6 release is on, is on current permanent hold until these issues are addressed. That is great behavior. They're not slave to the calendar, they're slave to the quality of the product. Um, so. Kudos to Kubernetes. That type that of stuff makes me, as somebody who's operationally focused, really excited. Right? Stopping, you know, doing a, uh, a cleanup release, and then holding that release until it's working. In 1.5, they added some primitives that were necessary to make the OpenStack pieces work, um, and Helm charts advanced to enough of a degree that it could get there. There's some stuff coming um, in operators and things like that that look like they're going to make this, this effort even easier. Um, so I'm super excited. Um, but what this is doing is it's using Helm, which is a Kubernetes primitive. So my first requirement was we're not going to deploy OpenStack on Kubernetes using a whole bunch of external automation and orchestration to just sort of poke Kubernetes. We actually want to do it using Kubernetes primitives, um, which is important if you don't want, if, if your Kubernetes cluster is going to do things besides OpenStack. Um, it's a complete fail to me, somewhere on these slides, it's a complete fail to me if you say, oh, I'm going to install Kubernetes, and the only thing that Kubernetes cluster does is run OpenStack. Don't do it. That's, that's not a good use of, of an underlying infrastructure. So the way this is being done is you can use that Kubernetes cluster to run other workloads, and then you can scale your OpenStack cluster up or down depending on actual need. Um, not say, oh, I need another Kubernetes cluster to run other apps. Um, that ends up being a really bad thing. What it's doing is it's tagging. If there's a feature in Kubernetes called tagging um, that allows you to identify different nodes, and we use the tagging so that you can put different uh, workloads on, in different places in your cluster, so you still have control over where things are running, which ends up being important for OpenStack. Um, there's something called daemon sets, daemon sets, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, that allow you to take a container, schedule it through Kubernetes, but treat it like it's a trusted, hosted node that you need to do for a lot of OpenStack services. So a lot of these charts are using daemon sets, which is not my favorite way to solve this, solve this problem, but it works pretty well. Um, Databases are using stateful sets, so they have to have that persistent layer through Ceph. Um, and then one of the things that the at and team really wanted was to have multiple sources of containers. So they're actually using the Stackinetti's containers, you could use the Cola containers, you can, you can start turning knobs. Um, and it's one of the things I really like. There's a lot of choices that you can make in doing these deployments. Um, so even though it's Kubernetes, it still isn't that opinionated. And so there's, there's this balance between being too opinionated and being too open. And right now it feels like they've got a good balance. Um, but there's a lot of hard work. So uh, what we're, we're, the networking stuff, which is confusing because you have two layers of networking has to get resolved. You have to actually map physical networking into Kubernetes, which doesn't, it's sort of hard to do. 
Um, you have to do a whole bunch of configuration injection, which OpenStack is just figuring out. Um, and there's no consistent patterns. And storage is still very primitive, right? Installing Ceph with Helm charts, unless you have something like Digital Rebar that knows how to enumerate all the drives on every machine and then build Helm charts for you based on that enumeration, it's going to be, you're going to have trouble building a good storage infrastructure. Um, those are all solvable problems. Uh, we're looking for people who want to solve them with us uh, and want to get the stuff accelerated because that's you know, how we, we operate. Um, so those are all, I think, very solvable problems. The bigger challenge to me that we'll see in Boston is how OpenStack projects are going to handle some of the issues that are exposed by having immutable containers. And right, the community as a whole is going to have to decide to prioritize work that, it, that we expose uh, with this. We'll probably find some hacky workarounds, like pinning services to the machines, but that's not really where this should go, right? Hopefully, in Sydney, um, we'll actually start having conversations about, hey, you know what, I want Horizon to be completely immutable so I can move it back and forth between different servers. I don't, I don't think any of these containers are, are there yet. So this is what the infrastructure looks like. Um, if you go back to my earlier slides, this is significantly better. I was expecting we would stand up services outside of, outside of Kubernetes. Um, the impressive thing with this is that every single service that you need to run OpenStack is represented as a chart. So, um, Ceph, uh, dashboard, databases, Rabbit, um, it's all in containers running on the system. That creates some challenges because your software defined networking and your storage are actually built back into Kubernetes, and the networking models are not that robust compared to what OpenStack is used to in that. And there's some projects, I think it's Curler, that is used to actually do Kubernetes networking through uh, for Neutron. But the circularity of these things are tricky. Um, networking in, in Kubernetes uses something called CNI, which is a Docker interface. Um, and it's surprisingly resilient in that you drop in new uh, CNI plugins, and then the system recognizes that you have a new networking plugin, and it pulls it in. So it's very possible to take a Kubernetes cluster, add networking to it, and then uh, have it sort of morph into a new, a new beast. It's not clear yet quite how we're going to do those things with Neutron and fix all, fix all the pieces together. Um, it's possible we could just sidecar it and attach Neutron to a different NIC. Um, and this is, this is the place where the edges get fuzzy on a lot of the stuff too. Um, and then it's important for me that we, we don't look at this as an open stack only thing. You can say, I want these nodes to run open stack. I want to leave capacity for other workloads in my infrastructure. Um, my expectation is that if you're doing this, you're going to make your VM nodes uh, open stack only compute nodes. You will try to squeeze some containers in around the edges because um, I think that that's just a recipe for disaster. I'm not sure. If it's perfectly easy, um, uh, which is where it's Carmel, it's perfectly Carmel to uh, separate the workloads and say these functions are only for OpenStack node compute nodes, and these are for general purpose uh, Kubernetes functions and nothing And I've already been talking to the slide. So these are the these are technical challenges that remain. Um, we still have to figure out upgrades both for Kubernetes and for OpenStack. Uh, there's no magic bullet. Um, there's still management tooling that's going to be necessary. Packaging containers is important, although it seems like it's OK. The thing that made Cola get very complex is that Cola is actually packaging containers to manage Cola inside of the deployment for Cola. Yeah. Um, which make, makes perfect sense if you look at what their code does, but they needed containers inside the environment to, to run Ansible for them. Um, and we still have similar problems with this. You have to have enough awareness of the environment and the, and the infrastructure to make things go. Um, Docker, uh, happy birthday. You're still only four years old. Um, right? we're, we're still in a, challenge, in a place where if we're doing this work, we're relying on the Docker engine to run the containers that are running our core infrastructure. And so, um, 
And all the cargo stuff we did is dockerized Kubernetes. So it's containers out, out you know, containers, not, not in containers, but the, the deployment that we're using, all of the services are actually deployed as Docker containers. So any issues with Docker, if you find weird bugs, if they patch it, if they roll out a breaking change to the API, which they do every version, then um, you are, your whole infrastructure is at risk. Um, and it's not just, I mean, your whole infrastructure is at risk at, at layers and layers of your, your infrastructure, its operating systems, the hardware, and all that stuff. But Docker is especially fragile. Um, right now, it's getting better, but it's still fragile. Um, and things like Rocket or another container mechanism, scheduling mechanism are still maturing along, along the ways. And so, um, probably by the time somebody's really ready to do this, um, it will work better. It always has. I, you know, I have to say I'm impressed with the, the pace of progress. Um, and storage and networking we talked about. Cool. So, yeah. Operability is not solved, right, by fixing the underlying platform alone. So you can't just put in Kubernetes and say, hey, the, the challenges I have operating over the stack are now no longer challenges. Um, all the best thing that we can hope for is that the community operates more synchronously and they can share and get the benefit of working together. So the thing that I would love to see is that the community can actually collaborate more on operations if people are using shared infrastructure. That would be a big deal. Um, technical leadership has to decide that this is a legitimate and important way to do things because it will require operable code changes to implement um, into this mechanism. Um, we have to fix the, the messaging. I know for a fact the board is working on this. Um, and there, it's going to be an unwinding uh, when we do it. I'm not even sure you can. I think that OpenStack. This is speaking as a former board member. OpenStack has to figure out what place they have in the hierarchy of data center infrastructure, and it might not be as high as we thought it would be a couple years ago when, before Docker came and, and sort of uh, disrupted the whole data center, how we deploy applications. Um, I think it is, and along those lines, I still think it's necessary. I think that the way for OpenStack forward is to look at technologies like this, embrace them fully and collaboratively, and then find out ways that that makes OpenStack stronger. Because from my perspective, the operators of OpenStack want this type of solution, right? They are operating Kubernetes. They're hearing that they're going to be operating Kubernetes. They're hearing that probably more, actually, I know this. They're hearing they're going to be running a Kubernetes infrastructure, or Mesos infrastructure, or something like that, more than they're hearing that they must run. OpenStack because no developer shows up and says you must run OpenStack, but a lot of developers are showing up to their ops teams and say you must run Kubernetes or Mesos or Branch or Swarm or something like that. Um, and so that is going to switch priorities really, really fast. Cool. Send the presentation. <laughs> And I have questions. I'm happy to question this now. I've fully done this is like two simultaneous presentations. Um, because you know, we've got questions about open about the presentation. I'm happy to talk about that. And then um, if you want to drill into what the tech is doing underneath the covers, um, yay, deployed it. Um, and I can take a second and actually show you how to figure out if you want to do so you can totally replicate this stuff just as easily as I showed you. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes to install digital rebar. You can walk through the wizard and we'll set this stuff up. Um, I can take take a second and show you how to figure out how to actually access the OpenStack cluster, and then I'll take questions. Does that sound good? So here in this cluster that I just built, um, I've got a problem in that Kubernetes networking space is internal to Kubernetes. Right? It doesn't have an external networking space unless you add a load balancer and expose ports through a service identifier outbound. Kubernetes is designed to talk east-west. You have to enable uh, north-south communications. Networking terminology. So what that means is I have to go to my head node. 
So this is the, the, the node where I deploy Kubernetes. When I open that node, I'm going to get a, a self-generated certificate. I'm going to need to log in, admin. So the defaults, these are configurable, but did admin change me? Or is it root? I always get this confused. Does root change me? This is Kubernetes. It's a bunch of APIs. If you want to use the UI for it, use slash UI. And this, this will give you the dashboard. So this is my fresh minty Kubernetes install. It's the dashboard. Um, Literally, this is right. Same thing. You can click through the Kubernetes wizard that, that we have, and you get Kubernetes set up. Same, same thing. Um, and then from here, it's installed a couple of different namespaces. So staff, uh, fault. So I have a bunch of net checker stuff. If I switch to the OpenStack namespace, you're going to see all of the. If you're an OpenStacker, all of the friendly, comforting uh, project names that you're used to seeing. And each one of these is now running basically a pod providing that service. And if I go into Horizon, which is the UI for OpenStack, you will see my one Horizon container, because I only asked for one server, is running happily. And it is running on with this cluster IP. Now, this isn't the node that it's running on. It's the IP address that pod is advertised. It takes a little bit of time to get used to Kubernetes from that perspective. It's not, it's designed to be a distributed system, so you don't get, oh, here's the IP address of the node you're running or the VM you're running. It's here is a service entry point for you. We will make sure the traffic gets from that point to your container. Right? 12 factor apps, different, different design. Anyway, so I'm going to take that. This is not a public IP, so I have not exposed, exposed this. I'm going to uh, do this. There it is. So what I have to do is I have to SSH. Uh, so digital rebar sets up my SSH key so I can SSH into all the nodes in my cluster for me. So it propagates my access. And I'm reading up at the top of the screen. So 147, 75, 64, 31. All right, so this will let me SSH into the machine, and then what I need to do is do a port mapping. So I'm going to map, uh, I've already got 80, 80, so I'll do 81, to the internal IP address to port 80. Whoops, port 80. So if you're not used to doing this with SSH, this is called a port forward in SSH, and what I'm doing is I'm saying, you're going to SSH into this box, and then you're going to let my local machine direct traffic on port 8081, to port 80 on this remote machine. So it's a it's a traffic forwarder. It's letting me into the remote, into the remote data center. So that's just going to look like an SSH connection, and now I have these ports running in the background. When I do that, uh, 127, port 8081. So my 8081 on this machine is forwarded to my fresh OpenStack cluster, and it's going to come in and ask me for OpenStack, which should be admin and password. That looks great. Yay. All right, so this is it. You know, during, you know, in the course of doing this demo, I've actually gone through and done a complete OpenStack Kubernetes deployment element install OpenStack on top of it. So this is huge, right? It's a ton of technology all working together pretty seamlessly, um, and now ready for us to then take the next level. So with that, right, well, that's the end of the demo. Questions? CNI, so CNI, Docker CNI is um, it's the container networking interface. And so basically, you can drop containers or executables into a directory that Docker does to pick them up. Actually, it's a, yeah, it is a Docker uh, thing. And so as you build new networking technologies, you just drop in containers into those directories and it will pick those up, actually. Mm -hmm.
Um, so on this machine, this so this is the head node for my cluster by Docker PSS. Can everybody see is this big enough? It's okay. Um, oh, now it's not. Um, so <laughs> this should scare you. It scares me. Uh, this is the containers that are running on this system to run um, Kubernetes and, and this networking and OpenStack all, all together. So this is the Docker um, container set. Uh, yeah, tons of stuff going on. That's, that, that is how people are deploying Kubernetes. They're containers on containers, you know, containers with containers, sidecar containers on one container. Oh. All right, so two questions, not necessarily totally related. One is, when do you think this stuff will be ready for someone to actually run like a, a production like uh, like, yeah, how, like how big scale? 10 nodes, uh, like 100 nodes? Let's say 100 nodes, 100 nodes is a good number. All right, but let me ask a question first. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll be back done. I have that guy. Because so if you go back to the to the OpenStack layer, like if you try and do like you have a provider network and all that stuff, like you run an instance, catch one in that gate, like and like, do all of that stuff. It's it, ready. It's partially configured, it's not completely there. So um, yeah, so like it, it's not using a, I think it's using a flat neutron. I have to dig into the network. This is where so my, my co-founder, uh, Greg Althaus, is enjoying spring break. So uh, he would he'd be a better person to address those questions. Um, and we're happy to you know, be in community and, and, and talk about it like that. Um, it's not all the way there. Um, the, there. There's some great conversations about trying to get that next level. And we have some ideas about how to do it. Um, Neutron is going to be the, the bottom line. Without a doubt. Yeah. So that, that is the fact. Yeah, so even like 10 nodes, because it's like, Operationally, yeah. uh, some scale points, but operationally, it's not that different from 100. No, it's not. So, the, the question is you know, what's going to take to scale this? Um, I, I actually think, with some serious um, dedication in it, which to me is like two or three people working, it's about three months. Most of the problems that we're seeing are within sight of being solvable. If you were willing, probably, to compromise on certain operational challenges. Um, but I think you could put um, a, a reasonable production workload in this pretty quickly. That's, uh, Greg and I, I asked Greg that specific question because we have people who were like, all right, is this going to take six months, a year? You know, and, and he was more like three months of, of dedicated effort for it. Yeah, I, I guess it feels like there's a, quite a few ways uh, to overcome like, around, like, you know, your overlays on overlays for the network. Uh, and some other stuff where you're really going to be reliant on OpenStack to get this shit together as much as Kubernetes and or the Helm stuff. So, so, around. so the question, the question is, you know, how many, how ugly is it going to be? Um, and, and the nice, and, and sort of the nice caveat on that is that if you needed it to go quicker, you could get uglier. So it would be entirely reasonable to do what I don't want to do, first pass, and say, you know what, we're not going to share this cluster with anything else. We're just going to make it an open stack cluster. And you could say, you know what, we're going to bond, we're going to, we're going to have a separate network uh, for Neutron and not try and come in with the networks. Those hacks, very doable, and that would solve your problems. The, the thing that's going to take longer is where you actually try and create some network synergies between them. Now, the idea of having network synergies between a VM and a container is huge. So I could actually actually start mixing and matching. Oh, here's my containerized pieces, and here's my stateless pieces, and here's my containerized pieces, or my VMs, containers, and stateless, and mix them. Wow, that gets really cool. Um, and it's actually logical thinking that Neutron could help build those bridges. Um, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. You probably also end up doing something like um, Calico or one of the, the real overlay network styles, less um, uh, ODN or something like that, which I think is going to be harder to accomplish in containers. Well, and also I think if you're like looking at Cisco or something for like a, a physical network that supports SDN, then maybe that would both be the thing and just work with the physical switching. 
That I, I so the question is, can we do it with physical switching? I don't think the, the Kubernetes stuff against physical switching is as advanced. So I think your laggard's going to be how long the Kubernetes pieces do it. Because I'll tell you, as much as you know, I'm, I'm excited about Kubernetes on metal. You know, there's a minority of us um, that care, and so, and this this to me is is a huge takeaway for for the OpenStack community and for any project. If you are not cloud first, don't show up, right? Uh, Plum Grid, who I thought had some really interesting technologies, they're gone in part because they couldn't operate their SDN layers in cloud infrastructure. So. The, the technology, the SDNs that are going to win, in my opinion, are the ones that are cloud enabled. So the, the Calicos and the Weaves, because even if they're, they don't scale as well as like an open contrail, they, they're, they're 80 percent of their initial use is going to be in uh, cloud infrastructures, and the metal is going to be back the backstory. Um, even if it's big, it's still the backstory. Question. Yeah, I And so, boy, I, I can't, I'm not even trying to repeat the great points. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you're, you're right. And one of the reasons why we're excited on the physical side is because all of those issues are real issues. Today, people are still you know, just writing apps for Kubernetes. There aren't that many people worried yet about I.O. performance and networking uh, latency. Um, and I think that there's a whole raft of GPU uh, enabled Kubernetes stuff that should come down the pipe because people use it to deploy applications and, and pin. Um, the stuff that we're showing you, there's no reason you can't do more segmentation for it and like separate your etcd cluster out from your Kubernetes API servers. And those are totally manageable things to do in, a, in these infrastructures. Um, and so that I, I think there are real concerns. So. Part of my background and part of my, my frustration, the thing I start writing my teeth about, is when I see a dev stack style upgrade, right? So I'm, I'm distinctly not showing you a boot coup, which is the one that uh, boot, you know, Kubernetes one, one, oh God. Those things I think are really, they're handy for developers, they're really destructive for operators. And so, right, you know, You'll notice our default OpenStack deployment was actually a 12 node cluster. Um, and and those, are, those are real operational concerns. That's what we need to be doing as practice deployments. Um, it makes me very nervous. And then I have this, we have this problem with the, the Ceph stuff that's being done here, but all the testing is single node Ceph. So the idea of building a real Ceph cluster is not baked into the Helm chart yet. Um, it's doable, but it's not the default behavior Right. It's not what you're going to see come out of Zool when they get it. Um, and that makes me sad. Like the operators need us to be doing multi-node testing. Um, that has to be part of, of our daily routine. Yep. Um, one of the questions I have to do is that you Um, 
So, so you know, the question, the question is, where do I see operations going? Um, favorite topic of mine. So, I'll, but I'll, I will not fully answer it. Um, if you haven't looked at cycle liability engineering and read the Google cycle liability engineering book, go do that. Um, what when I when I look at serverless and Kubernetes, what I see happening is developers are tired um, of doing infrastructure. This is where I so this is where I see operations going. I think DevOps is a huge success. Developers want to own their code all the way into production. They don't want to mess with infrastructure and doing that. So they look at serverless, they look at Kubernetes or platform as a service, and they will totally own I wrote code and made it go to production. They will not own how many servers are running, and are the SSH keys right, and are the certificates set up, is the load balance running. Right. I think we're going to see a segmentation of concerns where a smaller operations focused team, a cycle liability engineering team, as Google would call it, is responsible for running your infrastructure um, and, and, and treated like an engineering team, like a development engineering team. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the, you know, the ideas of developers writing a whole bunch of chef scripts to maintain infrastructure, I think that it's going out. Right? Developers just don't. I don't want to spend their time maintaining infrastructure. Um, it's going to be a specialized team thing. And I think we can, and, and to CoreOS's point, I think we can make it a lot better by having code reuse and built into operations and, and autonomous automation and things like the stuff we do takes uh, Rain BIOS configuration and machine provisioning and it turns it into a you know, basically a service you don't worry about. It, it's going to get better. But it's, I think that's. I think we're going to have much clearer boundaries again between operations and development. Good question. Favorite topic. So, part along those lines, what do you see as the future for these gaps to kind of involve with containers? You know, they kind of uh, there's overlap, and they used to claim that no, no, they can coexist. Complementary yeah. blah blah blah, but. It's <laughs> so the question is check and pop it, um, even the Ansible. I, I think that the, the tools are really important, but the days that they are something that are ubiquitous for all developers to know how to do are a way in point. Um, Chef recognized that they did a really smart pivot with Habitat, um, and so they're, they're owning multiple tool sets. Um, but yeah, the idea is that a developer should, should run, learn Chef. Um, and what Chef does and the way configurations are managed and things like that, I think have really changed in thinking because of Docker. So maybe I should step back. I think container, putting code in containers and then configuring containers with multi factor apps and shared secrets and things like that have really reduced the need to manage machine configurations the way those tools were trying to do it. So we, we sort of changed paradigms. Now, if you look at down in the middle and what we do, those tools are still necessary. We use them; they're very really important. Um, but they're much, they're much more baked in. They're not, they're not something like people are writing a whole bunch of chef cookbooks to deploy, you know, stuff that you can deploy in containers. Great question. We are in remarkable shift in the last couple of years. If you spent a lot of time learning chef, I'm sorry. It's still a great product. Kubernetes smart is Nova. Um, it's not. So the it's not. It, we, this is not using Kubernetes container scheduling to move um, Nova to a new server if it failed. That's the type of stuff that's going to take some rearchitecture. 
it's really saying this server runs this container, and then that container joins to the Nova infrastructure, and it's the Nova server. So it, it's, it's not that it's not using Kubernetes to really dynamically map and move containers around. Now it will, if that container fails, Kubernetes, the kubelet will restart it because it's set to do that. And Docker will have less behavior you get from Docker. But, so you get some, but not that type of dynamic. I kept my container, so that's a, that has to be on the set. So it seems like you don't see properties of stateful session and daemon set. What happens? It seems like if the daemon daemon set brings back up, you know, the cube. It's it's well it's, it's really a scheduler problem. So the, the idea would be if I took if, if I moved <laughs> if I moved my container my my Nova my Nova compute container to another machine one you don't want that to be on another Nova container that would suck it has to be a fresh machine and then the IP address and the scheduling and the resources and all that stuff has to get fixed and so Nova is not really set to do that type of dynamic. Oh, I'm in a new place. I have a new set of resources. I, I, I need to spin up a new place. As a matter of fact, very few things are at the at VM management level. Or even, I think Mesos, the way Mesos scheduler works, it would, you know, the assets are all static. So you wouldn't, you would assume a node goes away. You're not taking a node and moving it someplace else yet. Um, there are people who are working on using Kubernetes to schedule VMs. And they would have behaviors like what you're talking about. And they would be using Kubernetes primitives. So give me a VM from Kubernetes. That's a whole nother talk. So I was actually just about to ask exactly about that. And that is with Kubernetes having talked about, I don't know how far along they are, doing VMs. I've seen demos. Yeah. Like, why even open that? That might be the right <laughs> question to close on. <laughs> Um, no, it's, it's a very serious concern. So um, I, I think that if it, there, there is a lot of, of knowledge and logic and automation and APIs and, and thought about how OpenStack works and why it works that way. And there are people who, so the, the answer is sort of two. One is inertia within OpenStack and people who are used to consuming it and want to consume it. So I think that that's very real. You know, you get uh, big telcos and people who Done deployments like CERN, their migration they need it. They need they are going to keep using OpenStack um, for good reason. Um, I, and the reason I like this approach is that then they can incrementally migrate to Kubernetes as they're ready to. Um, and then the other side of it is I think that it's a much more complex problem than people um, realize to do VM scheduling, and so. I, I'm not sure how well those um, cement techs are going to map because what Kubernetes does and how it treats scheduling is really different than what OpenStack does, and it's different for good reasons. It's just like the way we treat metal is really different than what OpenStack does and different than what Kubernetes does, and each one has its own abstraction needs, and I wouldn't mix them, right? I wouldn't tell you to use us if all you needed were VMs, and definitely not if you were containers, right? You, you use other open source technology give you the right instruction. So, so. All right, and I will let that be the last question. Thank you, I really appreciate the time. I hope this was helpful. Um, if you have questions, please come to the community and play. We're happy to talk to you and, and, and innovate with you. Thank you. Nice socks, by the way. Oh, we're. I was a chef. I'm like, Yeah, yeah. I think I'm gonna make it. Okay. Yeah, I was definitely. No, they said they were from our movie. I was definitely. No, I was at the first chef summit, and then I was a chef conference at the airport. Yes, at the Marriott airport. Okay, okay. I've been a, I think you're with those guys. Oh, yeah, no, they're great. Go, go. Hey, how are you? I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. No, actually, I, I, I love those questions. You know, I'm not, a, I don't, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm saying stuff that some people are going to find offensive. No, I, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, you're still running the, uh, 
sig ops, right? Yeah. Yeah, me and Ryan tried to do those last year, but signed in for me. We tried to get that. Oh, the local, the local. No, no, the uh, the cluster ops, the cluster ops, and uh, Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. or, we, that, so. we are, the, the challenge that we're having, and this is common in Kubernetes. Oh, we didn't talk about this. It's getting, yeah. um, the challenge that we're having is that people who are doing Kubernetes are doing it, are interacting with operators in their deployers. So like we will go to the cargo, but we use cargo, so we're in the cargo sig. And what we're trying, what we're, the, the co-chair and I are, are trying to figure out how to create a, an Uber Operators, which is what our goal was, right? Because what's happening is that you know, we're getting the same fr same fragmentation that yeah. happened in OpenStack. It was horrible. So, so like Kube admins doing their thing, and Cops is doing their thing, and then um, CoreOS does their thing, and then and then yeah, and that's hard though. That's hard. Everyone has their own opinions, right? Like, you know, Cargo, like you said, they use Ansible. Um, uh, Blue Cube uses a similar approach to uh, operators that you know, CoreOS does. So, you know, 